you're not dealing with VR experts, you're dealing with very much lay people in terms of the technology. So you have to have a headset that's plug and play, very high ease of use. I think any companies getting started in XR and health uh, have to be very conscious about the paths to commercialization. And one of the problems we deal with in senior care is just uh, resources and the time that people have to adopt new technologies. So we have to make the technologies very easy to use in these healthcare settings. The first one is regulation, right? So you need to have, assuming you have medical claims, you need to have FDA in place and operate as a medical device company. The second thing is reimbursement. You have 7,200 insurance companies in the US each and every one of them can do whatever they want. So you need to convince as many as you can to reimburse the solution. Then you need to convince clinicians or physicians that this solution is actually makes sense. And then you need to make sure that the patient are actually using it. You know, you need to succeed in each and every one of those verticals in order to have a successful deployment out there. One of the biggest failings is for engineering teams to focus on what they think needs to be changed, the solutions they think need to be implemented, rather than interacting with the surgeons and seeing what it is the surgeons want. Because the surgeons, you know, they're not gonna care about uh, 50, 750 frames per second versus 800. They're going to care about what clinically relevant data can you show me. So improving the surgeon experience and making sure you're focused on the customers versus on focused on what engineering cool things can you show, I think that's one of the biggest things surgical theater focuses on. One of the things that tends to be a big miss for solutions is a focus on how realistic your 3D assets in your virtual reality solution need to be for you to be able to hit home the value proposition of your product. Let me give you an example. In the training space, you can offer someone a virtual reality solution that offers them training for procedural skills or for technique. In technique, realisticness, uh, the accuracy of 3D models, your environment matters a whole lot more as opposed to teaching someone a procedure. So understanding how realistic you need to make your environment and all the 3D assets in your virtual reality application is really important. After a certain point, your end users may not notice or gain the benefits of that extra 50, 100, or 200 hours that you put into refining the textures or the shaders or the lighting on that one model. Let's call it the consumer version is not relevant for healthcare, right? You cannot put kill the zombies in, uh, you know, in the same headset when you want to treat someone for phobias or want to treat them for uh, anxiety, right? So you have to create a solution that is tailored for the healthcare market. So what we're doing, we're putting a lot of emphasis and resources to make sure that once we are shipping a device, it's a healthcare device. It's not another consumer grade, and it's not even enterprise. It's a healthcare type of device, durable medical equipment for that matter. And, and with that, I think we are increasing the chances of success because you're speaking the same language that you're supposed to within that environment. In building a virtual reality solution that scales, you know, we start with the fundamentals. If your solution, especially if it's intended for the healthcare market, is intended to integrate with other clinical information systems, it must be built from the ground up, trying to observe those standards, and you must have an understanding of how those standards will play in the ability of your product to interface with those other clinical information systems especially in the healthcare market, if your product is intending to collect or store any personal health information of your patients. That will help drive uh, a variety of policy and internal uh, management decisions around training your staff, as well as building your product in a way that securely holds or has a process for um, the deletion and the management of that personal health information products that are medical devices uh, across the globe are regulated in a way that they must be able to prove their effectiveness and safety as it's being used in a healthcare space. In order to do that, manufacturers or developers of solutions may find themselves uh, needing a quality management system, a risk management system, uh, the implementation of ISO at their organization and ensuring that their staff is well trained. 
identifying that early in your commercialization journey and understanding if that's going to have an impact on your product is absolutely essential uh, as a complexity to address in the commercialization journey. We cannot have VR devices as a standalone device that is not part of the workflow of a clinician or part of the cohesive treatment of the patient. So the question is, how do you plug in an XR device to a point that it's becoming standard of care? And how do you get paid for the, for the use of this platform, right? And how do you make sure it's constantly available whenever someone wants to use it? So we are trying to partner up with different types of players within the industry, in the healthcare industry, the tech uh, industry, software and developers, to make sure we're streamlining everything to a point that it's becoming a standard of care using XR, exactly like any other medical device for that matter. I think, you know, s scaling a solution is a, a tough, tough ask of any industry. And I think with when you're bringing a completely new technology into an industry that's traditionally very slow to uh, adapt to new technologies, it's definitely a challenge. Um, the way we've kind of found it to be useful is surgeons will listen more to other surgeons than they will to a rep. So finding our core base of say 15, 20 diehard users who say, I won't do a case without this, I won't see a patient without this, and having them interact with their peers and, and, and spend the time to introduce their peers to the te technology is a more powerful way of getting that information out there. Creating or, or identifying champions is all part of relationships. And that's what life is all about, building relationships. When you meet someone, it's important for you to understand the challenges that they're dealing with in their daily life. Um, helping you understand the challenges that someone else deals with gives you the ability to analyze their challenges and see if you can be a good fit. And it's important to, to ensure that there is a genuine fit for your product somewhere else because you don't wanna be in a situation where there's an artificial fit for your product and it goes through a, an implementation, but ultimately it doesn't deliver on the value proposition that your champion is really looking for. So building those relationships, getting to really know your clinical champion, understanding what their challenges are and how it impacts their life, their family life, their professional life, collegial life is, is really important for you to understand uh, in the process of identifying and supporting your clinical champion. Dedicated users are, are, are very difficult to create and it takes time, it takes energy, it takes dedicated, we have a great dedicated clinical team who is on site. You know, it, I say 24 seven and sometimes that's the case where we'll have employees get called in for surgery on 9 a.m. on Saturday morning for an emergent craniotomy or something. And so it's, it's a combination of one, having really great clinical people who are able to provide essentially a resident level of understanding based on their, uh, based on their interactions with the technology and provide that to the surgeons so that they are getting a seamless user experience. Yeah, so our clinical team is made up of what we call XR program leads. And so the XR program lead role is a role that really uh, it, it's varied, you know, we look for biomedical engineers a lot of the times because we want people who are very versatile. You need an understanding of neuroanatomy, but you also need not necessarily sales, but you need the ability to interact with customers and people be people facing. But then you also need to understand technology and be capable of working with computers at a high level and working with the VR solutions. So it really takes a, a, a mixed mind, someone who can focus on multiple things and be educated in multiple different fields at the same time. We, we got a couple of oral surgeons using our device, but it was awkward because the device was just standard VR type of device that was getting in the way of dentist hands trying to get to the mouth. And uh, so then we discovered um, the Vive Flow and we saw the first iteration of this almost a year ago, back in June of last year of 2022. And we've been working very closely with HTC ever since then. Uh, they've been incredible supporting us, uh, changing their software to work with our software. And uh, it's been an amazing experience. But now we have these relatively small goggles that are about the size of, of swim goggles. It is what we need for dentistry. So it's huge for us. So we're talking about 
device is getting smaller in various different parts of the world. This is one move to small that has just been amazing for us. Field of view really matters. Being able, especially in the vertical realm, being able to get and maintain a full field of view is very important in terms of immersing yourself in the mixed reality experience. And then high fidelity streaming is really the, that's really the area where uh, headsets can see the most improvement. Being able to function essentially as their own computer, their own monitor, all in one, being able to stream content to them, no cables attached. Think about an older adult. Uh, these folks did not grow up with Atari uh, game systems. Uh, joysticks are not part of this culture. Uh, but they did adopt FM radio, they adopted color TV, uh, they adopted the internet, they adopted smartphones, social media, and they're adopting VR. Uh, but we have to make it very simple and easy to use for these seniors, and we think hand tracking is going to be really remarkable as, as we develop the roadmap with HTC. Some of the new features our customers frequently request when it comes to interfacing with the headsets are things like voice commands and better hand gestures. Um, being able to, it, it's a very difficult task to have the, it accurately mimic hand gestures, so there are still areas where controllers are not just preferred, but much uh, better user experience. With voice controls as well, being able to speak to the headset and have it implement commands rather than having to access a menu and kind of interrupt that experience, I think those are the two areas we see a lot of demand. It's really important for you to understand how your device and your software on that device is going to be managed in the long run. That's where MDMs or mobile device management solutions really play a critical role. For you to be able to provide your end users and your organizations that you're going to be supporting with you know, comprehensive support in order for them to be able to successfully adopt your product, it's very important for you to be able to push out updates to your software directly to the client without them needing to you know, plug it into another PC and uh, get updates that way. So mobile device management solutions are really important to help deliver that in a, uh, a frictionless way so that your end user can get into your headset, quickly press you know, an update button, and now your application is updated and available with all its new benefits and all its new features. In addition to that, it's really important in the healthcare space for you to be able to manage security of a device. Aspects like remote locking, being able to report a device stolen, and being able to wipe it remotely are also really important in the healthcare space. So these components are inherently and natively um, requirements of an MDM that is necessary in the healthcare space and to make deployment of your solutions at scale more manageable uh, without necessarily needing a team of 100 support agents. We're using HCC's device management system at the moment. Um, we find that, at least for now, it allows us to hit home on the key requirements of our clients with respect to software seeding and being able to give them support on the overall system. So being able to monitor whether it's online, being able to manage updates that you're pushing to a headset. Because remember, we want uniformity uh, at scale. So you don't want to be in a situation where, you know, 30% of your end users are on version one, while, you know, another 70% of your users are using, are using version 2.0 that creates challenges and potential conflicts um, within your end user community to be able to use varying products with various procedures or workflows.